not that way. So in Agile as actually practiced, one of the things that we see a lot of is this issue of the sprint silos. So a lot of our clients are using um, uh, Scrum, and in Scrum, the iterations are sprints. And um, what happens is that these, these sprint teams are supposed to be these self-directing teams, um, which sounds good. You know, it's like, oh, you're going to empower the people at the line level, and it has this sort of total quality management sound to it, right? Anybody can stop the assembly line, and it kind of seems like it's just to be a good way to go. Um, and it does have its advantages, but one of the problems can be that the testers are 100% allocated to the sprint teams, and there is no mechanism for getting a good cross-functional view of what's going on. Then the testing, testing organization's ability to bring that awareness of all of the different things that are going on across all of the different applications goes away. And for a lot of our clients, that's one of the things they really like about having a centralized test team, that there's one group out there that actually has their hands on everything, and they know how everything works together. So it's very easy in, a, in an agile world for the, um, for the system integration testing and the interoperability testing to really suffer if there's not an active organizational <coughs> scheme, I guess you could say, uh, approach to, to making sure that doesn't happen. Um, we have seen with some of our clients, again, long hours due to overcommitment. Now, agile purists will jump up and down and say, well, that's not agile, that's not agile. People are supposed to be triaging features out of one sprint into the next sprint if they're not getting their, what they call the velocity that they are supposed to have. But what we found is that simply adopting a life cycle model, no matter what that model is, agile or not, does not change the fundamental human tendency to want more than what they're actually willing to pay for. And that's the driver of overcommitment. And sure, the teams are supposed to be self-directed, but what we found is that there are limits on that self-direction with a lot of our clients. And when the team starts saying, well, we're going to have to slip this, these features out into the next sprint, business stakeholders start screaming. And just saying to a business stakeholder, well, that's going to have to slip because that's the way Agile works. That Agile is not a magic bullet. You're not going to be able to just shoot the stakeholder with the Agile word and they'll go, oh, okay, and then it goes away. <laughs> it just doesn't happen that way in, in what we've seen. So we have still seen a lot of um, problems with overcommitment um, that, that really impacts the test team because you get these interior dates slipping, but the sprint dates are held, right? So they have these like four-week sprints, absolutely have to be done with the sprint at the end of four weeks. But there's no business driver attached to that, right? It's an arbitrary number, right? Four weeks is arbitrary. It could be five weeks, it could be three weeks, right? So you have the four testers getting pulled into this total fire drill crisis type of situation at the end of every four-week sprint for no reason other than basically worshiping this arbitrary date that's been set up by the sprint cycles, which is even more damaging of morale um, because it's, it's hard to justify it, right? I mean, what, what do you tell your spouse? No, I, I can't go to the kids birthday party this weekend because it's the end of a sprint. <laughs> you, know? I mean, it's, you can say, well, you know, we've got this big project and there's a million dollars or ten million dollars or fifty million dollars riding on it. That kind of makes sense. But, you know, it's the, end, it's the fourth week of the cycle and so we have to have this big fire drill. It's kind of not very compelling. Um, we do see with some of our clients late involvement of the test team. Uh, though that does tend to be less with the Agile models. That's one of the benefits of the silos, that the, at least the people are uh, dedicated. But if you try to solve the silo problem by moving people around from one sprint to another as the testing starts up, then you just create another problem. So you can't, you can't solve it organizationally that way. You have to solve it um, uh, through uh, greater staffing, basically. Um, one of the problems that we see with, uh, with Agile that has to be thought about and, and solved is you need to take the time to invest in long-term test process improvements. Um, 
it's, it's very difficult in, in some of these uh, Agile teams that we've seen because everything is focused on getting something that's client ready at the end of the sprint. And that's, you know, the, everybody's looking at that as the, as the goal, not thinking about, well, how do we improve our process over time, particularly the test process. So organizationally, you've got to plan for that. Um, and you also have to help people understand that testing is a specialized role. One of the things that's happened in some, some schools of, of agile approaches is to say, well, everybody's on the team, you know, as if everybody were interchangeable on the team. Um, so, you know, use whatever metaphor you want to try to, to, to explain why that doesn't work. I mean, one of the more obvious ones is, say, a sports metaphor, right? I mean, just because everybody's on a team doesn't mean everybody plays the same position, right? And you've got testers that are specialized as testers. They're bringing particular skills to bear. Okay, system integration is another life cycle, um, if you will, where we're taking components that have been built often by outside teams and assembling them together, right? Now, that may be outside, like outside of the organization, or it could be outside, like, uh, separate teams within the same company, but, you know, distributed in some way. So some of the things that you have to deal with here organizationally is getting visibility into the testing of the components before they get to you. If stuff just comes flying over the wall and you have no idea what shape it's in, then that makes it very difficult to plan, right? And thus, you know, how you organize yourself to deal with that is very challenging. Um, because the, the components are often created by, by different groups, um, there can be political issues that arise if there are a large number of problems discovered in a particular component create some, some dynamics that are difficult to deal with. So you want to make sure that you uh, sensitize people to this fact that, yes, we are going to find problems in the components. There needs to be a way of flowing that information back to the developers of that component, and they need to be able to deal with it. Again, overcommitment is something that you have to look at, particularly overcommitment driven by a large number of bugs. Um, same as with uh, sequential models, you know, you, you've got that overcommitment problem, you've got the potential for a large number of bugs creating a great deal of chaos and confusion at the very end during the integration testing and also, again, late involvement in the testing. So these are all challenges, organizational challenges that, you know, based on the life cycle model that you're looking at, you have to think about how am I going to overcome this, right? These things, if you just say, oh, well, this stuff will take care of itself. What we've seen with our clients is that it doesn't take care of itself. It erupts into a, a set of issues later. Okay, so we got to organize in a way that is life cycle aware and that deals with the challenges inherent in the life cycle. But that's, that's necessary, but that by itself is not sufficient because you, you then have to move to the next consideration here of what kind of skills do I need in my team? So um, there are four general areas that I usually think of when I think of skills for the tester. One is, is general professionalism, right? Um, reading, writing, getting along with people, you know, the ability to, to function in a business environment in an effective way. That would be true whatever you were doing. Right, whether you were an attorney or a doctor or a software tester or what, what have you, right? The general professionalism is required. There's an understanding of the technologies that are in use. And of course, that's a moving target, right? So, so that's something that we have to stay up on. Um, now, that's not to say that the testers necessarily have to be as technologically savvy as the system architects or the database administrators or the programmers, but they should have a basic understanding of how the technology works and what its weak points are. Of course, there's an understanding of the business or application domain. So the, the, the depth of understanding required here tends to depend